Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending our webinar today. My name is Sarah Bougie. I'm a business development manager with Alir. So happy to have you on the call today. Today's webinar is Treasury Transformation Through Automated Bank Reconciliation and Cash Forecasting in PeopleSoft 9.2. Just a couple housekeeping items for you guys. We do have all the attendees on mute today, so if you do have any questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to submit those through the online portal. We'll receive all those, collect them, and then Logan, our presenter, can go ahead and answer those at the end of the call. Throughout the presentation today, there's going to be a few poll questions that we will post up. It would be great if you could go ahead and participate in those questions and answer them through the portal online. That way we just have a better idea of who's on the phone and the audience we're speaking to, and we can kind of address all those things at the end of the webinar as well. So for right now, I'll go ahead and hand it over to our presenter, Logan Wacker. Hi, Sarah. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Perfect. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining the Allure team today. As Sarah mentioned, my name is Logan Wacker, and I'll be presenting on today's topic, Treasury Transformation Through Automated Bank Reconciliation and Cash Forecasting in PeopleSoft 9.2. In today's agenda, we will cover who is Allure and what we do. We'll cover the recently delivered PeopleSoft Bank Reconciliation update that can be found in the POM image 18 that was released middle of last year, we'll cover bank statement processing, how do we receive statements, how do we import statements into the PeopleSoft application. We'll take a deep dive into actually performing bank reconciliation from those bank statements. We will touch on some new delivered functionality, which is the Addenda Parse tool. We will take on our other major topic for the afternoon, cash forecasting and positioning, and then as Sarah alluded to in the introduction, we'll wrap up with some light Q&A and we'll save the rest of the questions for the end. We'll start with the Lear introduction. Myself, my name's, as I said, my name's Logan Wacker. I'm a senior consultant. I've been with the Lear for a few years now and I'm a member of our treasury management practice. It's been about the last six, almost seven years now in the financial services industry. A little about Allure. We are founded in 2005. We are celebrating our 12th year in business. What we do is we help our clients succeed by partnering with them to efficiently implement, integrate, and upgrade their software investments. At the same time, we provide strategic guidance to assist them with some of the best practice core business process improvements, and we specialize in unlocking the potential of those software investments through our various practices and teams. We have a deep commitment to excellence and quality, and that, maintain, that is maintained as one of our core values on a daily basis with our entire consulting and sales team. And some of our relevant practice areas are our strategic ERP services. They're the type of teams that do a number of our upgrades for us. We have our advanced tech team. We have a treasury management team, which I'm a member of. We do strategic advisory services, which they're our core business process improvement team. And then we have a team that handles a lot of our end user adoption and change management. In the 12 years that we've been in business, we've done, we have about 150 current client, or 150 total clients that we've implemented for current previous existing. Um, 30 of those, 30 plus of those are Fortune 500 clients and about another 30 of those are financial services firms. We've been a member of the Quest user community, user group community for quite some time. We've been an Oracle Platinum partner for some time and now as things start to shift from on-premise applications to the cloud, we've recently become an Oracle Cloud partner, cloud standard. Just to give everyone on the call, just to give everybody on the call an idea of the type of clients that Alir works for, we kind of have a full range of industry-specific work. So we've done a lot of work for Nationwide. You know, they're a global insurance company. We've done a, a significant amount of work for Pacific Life, which happens to be another insurance company. We've gone higher ed with University of Florida, Florida State, Emory. Um, my personal client right now, and a few of those folks are on the phone, is Allegis Group. They're one of the largest privately held staffing firms in the world. Um, we, we're, 
currently active with Yum Brands, which if nobody knows Yum Brands is who owns uh, Pizza Hut, Taco Bell, KFC, those, those types of brands. Now we'll kind of get into the meat of today's discussion of surrounding the PeopleSoft Financials Reconciliation Updates. And that leads us to our first poll question. So Sarah, if you could go ahead and take it away for me, that'd be great. Sure thing. So our first poll question today is, are you currently running version PeopleSoft 9.2, PUM 18, or greater? And the different answers are yes, no, you're not on image 18 yet, no, you have not upgraded to 9.2, and no, you do not utilize PeopleSoft financials. And we'll give it a quick minute for everyone to respond here. All right, and it looks like the majority aren't on, aren't quite on image 18 yet, or haven't upgraded to 9.2 yet, which is great, is we'll be able to go through all those different changes and important updates that are coming up for you guys. So hopefully we can answer any questions you have at the end about that. So give it back to you, Logan. Perfect, thanks Sarah. So before we really get into the meat of what the new reconciliation effort and forecasting efforts in PeopleSoft have really delivered to us, we want to talk about some of the alarming consequences of not having an automated solution in place. When you when you're in a record when you're when you have user group bases that are performing bank reconciliations and cash forecasting manually, it's in our experience that most of those teams perform those within Excel. Those Excel workbooks are very prone to error. Those Excel workbooks are very manual. You can have a number of issues with the equations you build in. You have multiple sources of data, whether you have multiple bank portals online that you log into and you take down bank statements and then you're trying to reconcile against payment that you know you've, you've initiated through those bank portals. So in doing all these manual processes to ensure that team members, treasury team members, accounting team members, AP teams to ensure that they have not issued any errors, we tend to build more and more internal controls into the process. Those more and more internal controls tend to be, again, very manual business process controls, and those end up being very resource heavy. Uh, it takes a significant amount of time. It takes a significant amount of resources. When that kind of trickles down to productivity being lower, when we're performing a manual reconciliation, it can take hours or days for an AP team to reconcile all its thousands of ACHs it sends every week, or if it takes a payroll team, somebody like a, a staffing firm who pays 90, 100, 120,000 people every week, manually reconciling those transactions is very time consuming. It can take them an entire week after a period close to reconcile those. And, and taking that shift to an automated solution allows us to do it on a daily basis. It also allows us to build in some, some more automated controls where we can try to avoid issues like having a financial restatement because we have to go clear up reconciliation efforts or money movement uh, efforts or you know you might have reconciled a fraud related uh, fraudulent related item so we we try to tend to leave with some of these alarming consequences to identify what the issues are with most current state manual processes and where uh, an application like a PeopleSoft can add a lot of value from a reconciliation and uh, automated cash forecasting effort. The new reconciliation solution delivered by Oracle PeopleSoft is both expansive and powerful. It delivers insight into your financials and it provides a solution to common business process problems and most of those problems, as I just alluded to, are we get everybody out of bank portals, we get everybody out of Excel-based spreadsheets, and we have a single data set inside PeopleSoft that we're leveraging ac across the financial suite to perform these reconciliations, to execute payments, to also uh, cash forecasting, bank statement reporting, and some of the other items that we'll get into a little bit later on today. Now, when implementing PeopleSoft's automated bank reconciliation, it allows you robust coverage of the PeopleSoft financial suite of products. And what we mean by that is now user bases can perform subledger reconciliation inside PeopleSoft. Uh, an example of a subledger system 
um, would be AP or AR or cash management where you might be initiating a cat an outbound cash management wire that next day we get a prior day bank statement and now we have a system side transaction that we're looking to reconcile against a bank side transaction or we might want to reconcile our AP batches. You might have an, AP, an internal AP team that's issuing thousands of ACHs and then varying pay cycles every day or every week or every month. Those ACHs in turn get reported as a single line item on the bank statement. So that creates a one-to-many situation. And we'll touch a little bit more on the one-to-many as that's some new delivered functionality that did not exist pre-PUM 18 in PeopleSoft. Another one of the advantages is doing book-to-bank reconciliation. Now, book-to-bank for our privately held clients, they don't tend to operate. They don't tend to have a book-to-bank reconciliation process in place because it's usually not needed. And, and I know in my experience, a number of our clients, existing and former clients, have had to perform book-to-bank if they're a public company. Um, for those of you who do not know what book-to-bank reconciliation is, that's where you're looking to sync up your GL account balances with what your external bank partners are, are reporting on, on each one of your external uh, accounts have domiciled at those banks. And we'll get into book to bank a little bit later on and show what that looks like in PeopleSoft for the folks who are new to that. The last portion of reconciliation is accounting. Now that we've reconciled these AP ACHs or these cash management wires or we're reconciling uh, posting interest or any kind of income coming into the account or closing out an AR item, now we want to account for that. And as we've gone automated, we don't want to then in turn have to tell our user base or tell any user base that now you need to go and post manual entries to your GL. So through the subsystems, whether you're initiating a wire and you're associating it with an accounting template or whether you have inbound interest and we're performing bank statement accounting and people's opt on it, we're generating lines, accounting lines in the subsystems and the varying subsystems that you guys have configured and we're posting those directly to the GL. And we can do that on a daily, weekly basis depending on, on client need. And now we'll kind of get into if we're going to reconcile, everything that we want to reconcile needs to go against the bank statement. So we want to touch on how do we receive bank statements and also how PeopleSoft processes them. And that brings us into our second poll question. So if you could take that one over, Sarah. Sure thing. So our second poll question today is, could your organization benefit from the automatic reconciliation of batch payments? Yes, no, or unsure? All right, and it looks like about 74% say yes, which is great. So Logan can go through the, all those different benefits. Thanks, Sarah. So how do we receive bank statements? I know a number of the existing clients on the phone have Swift in place. You guys might have something like an Alliance Light 2 in place. You might have a third party where you dispatch payment or you dispatch out of the gateway and then they manage the SWIFT relationship with the bank or a number of you might also have a host to host network in place with each one of your external bank partners. So if we use the as the example as a, pers a quote unquote perspective client, we integrate over SWIFT with every one of our bank partners and in return our banks can send us bank statements. We, they can send us BAI-2s, which is a pretty standard format that most of us are familiar with. We can receive current and prior date bank statements in that format, or we can receive SWIFT 940s, which is a prior date bank statement, or SWIFT 942, which is their version of a current date bank statement. And so through the SWIFT and the host-to-host -host connections is how we can then in turn bring bank statements into PeopleSoft to process them. So that first step is for us to receive those statements. We receive them in, you know, in whatever connection we ha we've outlined. From there, there is a set of delivered uh, application or uh, uh, delivered PeopleSoft jobs that we run to import our files and to, then to actually write that stage data into the application tables. From there, once we've used these delivered imports to get the information into the PeopleSoft system, we can actually review online through a number of online functional pages where we can see our current and prior day bank statements. 
once we've received the bank statements, now we're in a fully prepped status to begin our bank reconciliation and our cash forecasting as, a, as the bank statements are some key sources of data in both of those. Here we'll kind of get into our first glimpse of PeopleSoft for today. This is kind of outlining what the prior day bank statement pages look like. So uh, one thing to keep in mind are the current the current and prior day pages are segregated, but they do look identical just for the ease of functionality. So on the first screenshot to the left, that's where you're able to really monitor your daily account balances. You're able to see your ledger balances, your availables. You're able to see your one, two, three day floaters. Um, really, PeopleSoft comes delivered out of the box with a number of uh, delivered balance BAI codes and in, in working with your bank. You, if you guys don't already take in bank statements, you're able to really tailor what you want to bring in because you might forecast on a ledger balance, whereas another client might forecast on an opening available balance. And so being able to tune those in and then get really tailor what you need is, is vital in that situation. Um, if you move, if you shift over to the right side is where you can actually see all the transactional activity. So you can see line items for every transaction that was reported on the bank statement. Essentially what happens is we take in the, uh, the associated BAI code, BAI2 code with that transaction. We take in that reference ID that the bank is passing us. Um, we take in a bank date, a transaction amount, and then we'd also take in any associated addenda that's tied to those transactions if we're looking to use that further down the line in reconciliations or also in cash forecasting. So now we'll get into kind of the meat of the uh, bank statement reconciliation functionality. For the ones who have previously implemented reconciliation or even for the manual processes done in, in Excel, many clients and many prospective clients notice that they have a lot of reconciliation challenges. Um, we have multiple formats, so multiple formats being two different types of bank statements. If you receive a BAI2 statement and an MT940, depending on the bank partners, you've now received two di completely different formatted files that contain two different sources of information. You have uh, BAI codes for SWIFT codes getting those to sync up so that you can reconcile appropriately and truly identify those transactions and not drag your manual process on is very difficult. Um, receiving reference IDs or the lack thereof or the duplication of reference IDs as banks tend to not always map in appropriate fields there or tend to put in dummy information and, and that leads us to the incomplete data. Uh, it's, it's hard to post reconciliation and drive reconciliation from an automated fashion if you don't have a unique reference ID. Another one of the core reconciliation challenges is really protecting against fraud. So, you know, if, if you're a firm that issues checks, checks are very prone to fraud. We, you know, you can have somebody go into a cash, um, a check cashing facility. Hey, Logan, we lost you a little bit. Oh, can you hear me now? There you go. Okay, thank you. You lost that check fraud. <laughs> ah, so a lot of the issues we can have right around check fraud are where we have clients that issue outbound checks to pay payroll or to pay vendors. And those checks are very prone to being deposited at check cashing facilities and then also being cashed at the bank in the same day. In doing that, you receive your prior day bank statement the following day and your transaction has essentially been duplicated. And through a lot of these automation efforts, we're able to quickly identify fraud and be able to go back to the bank and, and take on the proper procedures and not drag this one out for too long. Now we can kind of roll into some of the core of what the reconciliation environment pre-PUM18 and PeopleSoft looks like and what it looks like uh, PUM18 moving forward. And so prior to PUM18 and 9.2, same with 9.1, we, we did not have an ability to reconcile any kind of one-to-many, many-to-one, or many-to-many. So if we had batch payments on the AP side like we've been discussing this afternoon, those could not be automatically reconciled. So what most user bases did was they would semi-manual reconcile those or they'd have their implementation partner build them a custom one-to-many solution. 
Now, with the advent of POM 18 and the new functionality that was delivered, now we have an auto, uh, have the automatic ability to reconcile on a one to many, many to one, many to many basis, and we still have a one to one in there as well. Now, as we get into some of the configuration that is associated with the bank statement reconciliation expansion, the overall configuration for the ones who implemented an automated solution like this really hasn't changed too much. You still first want to define the structure. You want to identify your reconciliation records, so the tables that hold the data that I'm looking to reconcile both from a system side and both from a bank statement side. We need to identify our field aliases, which are the names that we give to the record or to the field names inside of the tables that we're associating to. We need to configure our reconcile reconciliation statuses. So in those statuses, we need to set up that we want flags if the automated solution picks up a duplicate transaction, or if things are a miscellaneous tra transaction or uncategorized, or we obviously want to see one that's going to give us a reconciliation status, so we need to put those in place. And as I briefly touched on earlier, there's new functionality around an addenda parse tool. And so PeopleSoft delivered this addenda parser through utilizing the data export import utility. And so the export import mapping is where we can actually configure our parser to go and grab data out of the um, addenda that's associated with our transactions. And so once we've defined the structure, now we want to roll into defining the rules. So PeopleSoft delivers reconciliation rules by source. And if you recall from earlier the conversation, we talked about sources being uh, subsystems within PeopleSoft. So the accounts payable module, the AR module, the cash management module, we also have external transactions out there. So there's a one-to-many um, and various um, one-to-many, many-to-one, and many-to-many, -many and one-to-one -one rules that are delivered in PeopleSoft. And as we get further into this presentation, we'll talk about how those are configured and how those can be altered. Um, once, you've, once you've set up the structure for the export-import mapping, now you can actually assign the addenda parsing rules to the external account. So much like you would set up reconciliation rules and associate them with an account, you need to do the same thing with the parser. We need to define our reconciliation tolerances because we might have outbound payments that the bank then strips fees off at the end. So we have transactions coming we're reporting back on the bank statement for less than what the system side transaction is. So we try to build in a tolerance, whether that's a percentage or a dollar amount or even a date amount in other scenarios. And then we can associate those with our defined reconciliation rules as well. We can also put security controls in place. And so one big complaint of reconciliation and people saw from a security perspective is not having row level security. And what we mean by that is if you have an accounts payable team and a treasury team, they, in most cases, they shouldn't have access to each other's accounts, but there's no good way delivered out of the box until PUM 18 came out to build out rules to say the AP team can see accounts one through five, treasury can see six through 10. So now what they've done is they've expanded financial gateway security to give teams that ability so that they can lock down groups and define bank IDs, bank account numbers, and some other parameters to actually truly get down to the granular level and, and make the reconciliation effort a little more specific to the to the teams and their associated accounts. Um, now, once we've defined the structure and the rules, we need to link the structures between the accounts. And so prior to PUM 18, what would happen is when we would run the automated reconciliation process, it would build a lot of SQL in the background it would start trying to match these transactions automatically. And if it didn't happen, we'd either run treasury accounting or you'd start to have to address exceptions. Um, now we have a slightly different process where all the SQL that helps identify matching transactions is actually stored. And it's stored up there and it's called through a new app engine. And so anytime we define a rule, instead of having to write the complex SQL ourselves, we have a series of drop downs where we can identify all of our fields and our, met, our grouping criteria, which we'll get to here in a moment, and then we can build the SQL and store it at that point. Um, once we have everything in place, we, we've complete and finalized the definition of the reconciliation rules at the bank accounts. We 
complete our bank statement accounting. So we complete our statement activity types and our bank statement accounting uh, templates. And at that point, we're also able to link in our addenda parsing rules to the bank accounts. And at that point, we've got all of our configuration in place to begin uh, running automated bank reconciliation. One caveat that I wanted to point out to the group this afternoon was for the folks on the phone who have implemented reconciliation before, the top screenshot will look very similar to them. It originates from the reconciliation tab on the external account definition. And here's where you would come in at the external account level and say, hey, I want to set up this account. This recon method is automatic or semi-manual or manual. And then I want to define all the associated rules. So if I if it's an AP and a treasury account, then I set up the AP and treasury rules. Well, with Palm 18, they delivered a new page, which is our second screenshot on the bottom right there, the bank account reconciliation rules page. And that's where I can actually define all of the new rules at. So the one caveat is, is that to get transactions to reconcile, you have to have both the old page and the new page set up for both for each source system so that you're actually able to see these transactions and reconcile them. As we've touched on briefly today, we've there's four different matching types for automatic reconciliation. So prior to the PUM, the one we were all familiar with was a one-to-one -one reconciliation, which is one bank statement line matching off to one people side uh, system side transaction. And a prime example of that is the cash management wire, where your client or you might be sending an outbound MT101 that only contains one payment that one payment is going to be turned around and be reported on our prior day bank statement as one line item. And so then we look to reconcile those on a one-to-one -one basis where we match on all of our bank ID, bank account, date, amount, and a reference ID. Now our new direction that we've gone is the top right, the one-to-many, where we're matching one bank statement line to many system side transactions. And as we've alluded to today, a good example of that is an APACH where you, vote, you guys might have a pay cycle in place. That pay cycle issues a thousand pay, thousand ACHs every day. Well, you have a thousand PeopleSoft side uh, ACHs for that day, and your bank's turning around and reporting those as one ACH debit on the bank statement. So you need an ability to be able to group those system side transactions and identify all of them and ensure that they total that one ACH debit. And you can have a flip side where you can have a many-to-one reconciliation. That many-to-one can be um, many bank statement items to one PeopleSoft system side transaction. And a good example of this is somebody paying out an open receivable. So for whatever reason, a vendor might turn around and, and send three ACHs to close out one um, accounts receivable open item on our end. So then you'd have three payments that you're looking to match up to one system site receivable to close that out. And now that now we have that ability as well. And finally, and the one that we're actually seeing the least is a mini to mini reconciliation where you just have many system side transactions matching up to many bank statement rows. Um, the best example of a mini to mini that we are seeing is some banks, depending on payment size, like to break up large payment files. So if you are sending a large pay cycle, the bank, you know, if it's got 10,000 payments in it, the bank might decide to break it up into two 5,000 payment files, at which point they're reporting two ACH debits on your bank statement. So now you've created a situation where you have many banks, uh, bank side transactions matching many system side transactions. From a rules configuration perspective, they've delivered a series of new rules for a series of new pages, uh, admin reconciliation pages, that uh, allow us to group our system side, so our group our transaction lines, and then also group our statement lines. And then from there, we can decide what we want to have match criteria on. And from there, they've taken it another level, and they've delivered a filter criteria. So. A prime example of a filter criteria would be we might want to admit ACHs from ever reconciling on a one-to-many basis for whatever reason you might have. 
So you can go into your filter criteria and say anything with the payment method of ACH, omit it from any of these groupings because I don't want to bring it into this view. I might be reconciling it in another fashion or might be reconciling it manually, manually for whatever reason. The other nice thing about this page is for the ones who have had exposure to reconciliation pre-PUM 18, if you wanted to do things like change a field, if you wanted to take uh, reference ID out of your criteria, you you need to be a pretty advanced SQL user to actually be able to go out and write some of the SQL statements to to prep transactions to actually get them the way you want them to be set up in the system to then reconcile. And now we have these handy drop downs to where we can group everything, and it's actually fairly slick as far as the user interface. Sarah, that rolls us into our, poll question, our third poll question. All right, our third question today is, does your organization currently receive prior and current day bank statements from your external bank partners? All right. Looks like the broad majority of you do. We'll hand it back over to Logan. Thanks, Sarah. Um, one of the final items we want to touch on from a recon configuration perspective was earlier on I mentioned tolerances. So PeopleSoft's now given us an ability to define multiple tolerances for each grouping. So now we can put out uh, three-day tolerances because we might have varying situations depending on the account or depending on the bank where we might need to define tolerances at a different level. So you might want to set up to have transactions get pulled into view where it might be plus or minus one day where you're trying to reconcile or another prime example is building in an amount or a percent tolerance because you have you issue pay outbound payments and the bank takes their bank fee out of that file. And so you've got a payment sitting inside of PeopleSoft that's for a different amount than what the bank statement is saying it was for. So you build in an amount or a percentage tolerance based on what's defined in those fees with your bank partner to bring those transactions in and create a viable uh, reconciliation effort to avoid having all those items go to a acceptance or a, uh, exception status. Poll question number four, Sarah. All right, our fourth question today is, does your firm currently use spreadsheets to model cash forecasting and to reconcile transactions? Sixty-one percent of you said yes, still using spreadsheets. Thanks, Sarah. So now that I've kind of introduced the one-to-one -one reconciliation and a one-to-many reconciliation, these tend to be two, in our experience, two of the core ways that most organizations reconcile transactions, mainly between batch payments and then the individual payments that they uh, that they initiate. So I wanted to be able to show you guys some examples of what a one-to-one -one where a one bank statement line matches one PeopleSoft system side transaction. So in, <clears throat> in this example, in the top screenshot, you have a outbound cash management wire that went out the door for 461000 and some change that the next day was turned around and reported on the bank statement and now we want to perform a one-to-one -one reconciliation on this. So this transaction matches on reference, it matches on bank date, transaction amount, and type. And then on top of that, it matches on amount perfectly. So when you run automatic reconciliation on a scenario like this, that's, this will automatically reconcile on a one-to-one -one basis. And the second and final example we have is the APACH example that I've alluded to many times today where 
On the system side, you have an entire um, pay cycle that's sent out, in this case, 37 payments. Those 37 payments were reported as one ACH debit on the bank side. So now we've created a one-to-many situation where we want to reconcile these. So what happens here, these transactions match on bank ID, bank account, bank date, transaction amount. So the total of the pay cycle on the system side matches the total debit reported on the bank statement side, and then we match on type as well. So now we're going to get a little, take a little bit of a deeper dive into the new Addenda Parts tool that PeopleSoft delivered, as this is new to all of us. So what's happened is PeopleSoft has delivered a tool where a Denda parser can run after we have bank statements in the system, and then it, that uh, parser parses data and stores it in a separate table. So I'm going to walk you guys through the steps of how to get it configured and what it kind of looks like end-to-end -to, -end to get your parser to actually run, then we'll take a deeper dive on the configuration associated to it. So PeopleSoft first delivers two addenda parsers. It's, they have one for a prior day and a current day, or you have the ability to configure your own parse ID. Once you've configured it or shows that you're going to go delivered, you then need to associate it to the external bank account. You need to have bank statements in place, and then there's a separate PeopleSoft process that runs to actually parse the addenda in the fashion that we're going to configure that we're going to touch on in the subsequent slides into the new tables. And then from there, you might need to alter your addenda parse rules as well. So your addenda parse might want to go take your financial gateway transaction number out of the addenda because the bank doesn't pass it to you appropriately in the reference field. That parser can run. It can strip that value out of your addenda string, and then it will store it in a new table. Your deliver uh, PeopleSoft reconciliation rules won't associate that record appropriately. And so now you can go to that drop-down page for the bank account recon rules and actually reconfigure it to point it to that new record to then allow you to reconcile transactions. And that's kind of where a lot of clients used to put a customization in place and actually build a parser during the bank statement load. And so now they've delivered a tool that's configurable online to do that for them. And so once we've gotten through all that, then we're actually prepared to run automatic reconciliation on any accounts that you guys are trying to use uh, the addenda parser on. And so as we've touched on a couple of times today, that addenda parser needs to be assigned at the bank account level. So since it's a new functionality delivered outside of cash management, it also then needs to be associated to the bank accounts defined within the financial side. So on the left side is the the new bank account recon rules page where we assign all of our new handy one-to-many rules. And then on the right side, we have a new page where we associate our mappers to every unique bank code, bank account key pairing that we're looking to do so on. And so kind of the first step out of the, out of the six required steps for configuring addenda parser is really to define the high-level map attributes and the map security options. And so what we do here is if you look at the top of the screenshot where it says map, source, target, et cetera, that's kind of a timeline that helps you work start to finish end to end through configuring the parser. So here on the first page is where you either can pull up one of the delivered ones, like the delivered prior day mapper. You can define your own. You can set up the permissions, whether it's just your treasurer or whether it's open to everybody or the copy from feature on bottom allows you to clone an existing one if you just want to clone it and then maybe enhance it a little bit and avoid and you know have it do some of that heavy lifting for you. Step two is for us to identify the source data of the structure in the field. And so what we mean by that is the bank statement parsing and the addenda parse tool never happens inside of the bank statement tables in PeopleSoft. What it does is once the bank statement's loaded, it uses that bank statement table as a source document. And this is some technology that's delivered through the PeopleSoft document that's out that some of us may be familiar with. And so it takes the bank statement tables, it uses that as a source, and then we create a target. And that target actually is the new tables that are delivered for bank agenda. And so 
once the parser runs, it looks at all the source data and then it actually writes it into the target data. And then from there, then you associate those new fields with your reconciliation rules. Now we have to define what exactly we're looking for in the agenda parse. So kind of as a best practice, the table holds bank ID, bank account number, uh, statement ID, and then it delivers 10 reference fields that you can populate with pretty much whatever you want. Um, you have a lot of options as far as scanning the addenda string. You can go in and you can say, I want to extract the first five characters no matter what, because there's always something in that first five characters that you guys are looking to match on. Or you might have, in this case, a Fed reference number for one of your payments sitting inside the addenda string, and you might use that to reconcile on. So now you have the ability to go scan for a pattern that matches anything Fed reference number in the next what, 18 characters after that. So now once you've defined all of these, we can move into our kind of, um, oh, that's, we'll touch on this real quick. So here's where we, it gives you an ability to actually define your pattern and whether I want to look to extract or if I want to actually try to find a pattern or if I'm trying to concatenate two fields together, then here's kind of where you build some of that definition in that. Our, fil our fifth step is to define our data filter criteria. And here's essentially what we're saying, everything that we're going to allow um, to be hit in the addendum parser. So when you define it in a similar fashion as this is, which is, is the delivered mapper, it's just looking for anything that has a bank ID, bank account number, and a statement ID associated with it. And then it'll allow the parser to run on that data. And then on our final summary page, here's where we're able to validate really everything we've configured for our mapper. Once we say, yes, this is what we're, our desired addenda strings look like, this is what we're looking to pull out of them, and this is where we want to store it at, now you can validate this, save it, and then it, now it's eligible to be configured at the external account level. Early in the call, I touched briefly on book-to-bank reconciliation, so we'll introduce that for just quickly here. In book-to-bank reconciliation, it essentially gives us an automated reconciliation of our ledger cash position. So what we mean by that is it gives us a delivered ability to look at our GL account numbers that are associated to our external account numbers and see if our balances are in sync with what the bank's truly telling us we're holding in those accounts on a daily basis. So we can see unapplied balances. We can also integrate with payables and expenses or receivables or as I'm communicating, treasury. And so here's kind of what it looks like from a PeopleSoft standpoint. We're able to say, okay, here's the bank balance. So here's the balance in my external bank account. And here's the ledger balance in my GL associated account. Now I can identify if I have any deposits in transit, any unbooked payments, if I have any associated adjustments, maybe on the GL side. And then I can say, okay, I have an overall book to bank difference in this case of negative about 3.8 million. So then now I know that I'm out of sync with what the bank's telling me, and it's more of a do I have exceptions, am I missing something, and, and start to kind of go that reconciliation route. Now we've kind of wrapped up our general overview of what the PUM 18 bank reconciliation delivers and kind of giving you guys a brief overview of Book to bank recon, and now we can kind of float into what cash positioning and forecasting looks like now in 9.2. And that gets us to our final poll question of the afternoon. So our final poll question today is, does your organization have the need to perform reconciliation on any of the following payment types? Please select all that apply. So we have batch ACH payments, wires, checks, first presentment items, and creating accounts receivable deposits from bank statements. All right, and here are the results. So it gives us a good idea of the different types of payment that you guys are wanting to perform the reconciliation on.
we'll give it back to Logan. Appreciate it. Thanks, Dan. So now we kind of want to get into the life cycle of what cash forecasting looks like inside of PeopleSoft. So we start off with defining items like our time sets and our time spans. Essentially, a time span is do I evaluate my cash forecast on a daily basis? Do I maybe have a structure that I only want to evaluate on a quarterly basis, possibly a monthly, or maybe you want to take your entire ZBA structure at a bank and you want to evaluate what happened on an annual basis. And so you can define time sets and build calendars that's associated with those to actually kind of get those dimensions in place to help be flexible enough in your guys' forecasting needs. We also design, design, uh, define position source sets. Those position source sets are essentially what kind of data are we feeding into our forecast. Are we feeding in actuals, which actuals tend to be driven by prior day bank statements. So we'd be doing forecasting from there. Would we want to feed in current day statements for liquidity management reasons throughout the day and bring in our intraday feeds so that we can have near real-time reporting in our forecast and can better better monitor our liquidity position throughout the day. And so once we've defined those three tasks, we're actually able to create a cash forecasting worksheet. And inside that worksheet, we have to define our position source SQL. And so what our SQL does is essentially say, go out, look at my bank statements for this account, find me this BAI code, and then put all of these transactions inside one bucket in my cash forecast. So that position source selection SQL delivers a bunch of criteria that helps me categorize transactions inside of my cash forecasting worksheet. And then I have an associated worksheet definition where I associate all those SQLs. I define my currencies. I might define my foreign exchange rates if I'm in a multi-currency worksheet. Um, I can also define variance if I want to see the difference between intraday and prior day and see if I have any issues or if I'm loading any values and I want to see the variance with what happened versus what actually expect uh, what I expected. And once you get through that step, now I've completed all the configuration for the worksheets. And so now I can actually schedule my cash forecast. So it's a delivered PeopleSoft process that actually goes out loads in all the data based on my worksheet definition and then from there I'm, at, I'm able to look online and see man, manage my liquidity. I might have, I might want to enter a manual cash position. Entering a manual cash position essentially allows me to say, hey, I'm, maybe I have a missing transaction or maybe I want to account for something I know is happening outside of here or see what would happen if I would have put a million, extra million dollars in today. That manual cash position allows me to insert any value I want into my worksheet and then redo all the, or, uh, rerun all the math in there to see if that scenario plays out for me or, like I said, uh, help you balance out in issues like maybe a missing transaction or the bank failed to report on something. A lot of our challenges in cash forecasting are actually fairly similar to the challenges um, with bank reconciliation, the multiple bank statement formats, the SWIFT versus BAI2 statements. Um, since you have to write SQL, you have to be fairly, uh, you have to kind of really get down to the nitty gritty of the bank statement codes you're looking to pull in on that report on external accounts. And so if you're getting two different bank statement formats, then you have twice as much configuration to do. So there's some things that we can put in place to fix that, but that is, we do cite that as one of our biggest issues. Um, some of our clients also use addenda strings through a uh, minor customization that Alir's done a number of times where the BAI code might just not deliver enough granularity for me to categorize and forecast and position. And so what I can do is I can look for consistent addenda string patterns or I, now I can leverage some of the addenda parse functionality to help better categorize items inside of my worksheets and start to get to that granular level and be more accurate in our automated solution and avoid any kind of manual, entering too many manual cash positions to rebalance my worksheet accordingly. This is essentially what the cash forecasting results page looks like. It, it builds a grid. It allows me to, down the left-hand side, the source. Uh, so actually, down the left-hand side are all my uh, worksheet line items. So I build in my beginning balance. I want to identify 
um, what kind of line items do I capture? Do I capture all my inflows? Do I want to see my inflows at a more granular level? So I want to see ACHs and wires, or do I just care that I'm just capturing all of my inflows? Or maybe I want to report on my outbound checks separately from, yeah, you know, I might have AP checks, I might have treasury check, checks for some reason. So I might want to break those out so I can see that function out or see those transactions broken out and see see what's actually happening on a daily basis. Here's the manual cash position page I talked briefly about. It allows you to, it gives you a graphical interface online to essentially enter any uh, relevant transactional information into my cash forecast and have the math be recalculated. So it helps me pull in um, external transactions. It helps me rebalance my forecast. It can help me maybe insert a transaction that was missed by the bank so I get back into balance. So it's kind of a tool that kind of helps us uh, provide a second pair of eyes on our worksheet and really try to make any kind of adjustments that we need to make on the fly. Um, one thing I want to touch on is a customization that we've done for a few clients. What happens is we have a, and I'm sure many people can relate on the phone, many clients who at the beginning of every year, beginning of every quarter, or on a monthly basis, they forecast out what they're going to expect to happen. And so they want to be able to load those values into PeopleSoft and compare them against the bank statements and see what's actually happening. Um, with that, if they if they forecast on an annual basis, they might start to have issues where their forecast gets off or they're carrying forward a bad balance. And so we build this cash forecast rolling balance tool where it allows you to say, hey, I thought I was going to have a billion dollars today. I really only had 900 million. So I want to go out and I want to rebalance my cash forecast numbers to pull that bad 100 million out of there and not carry it forward so I can be more accurate moving forward. And so this is a tool that we've designed for a number, number of clients that have asked for that. And here is pretty much what our import looks like. So as I alluded to, you might forecast on an annual basis, quarterly basis, monthly basis, and you want to put those numbers into PeopleSoft so that you can actually see them side by side with your cash forecast results. So there's a deliver tool that gets these transactions into PeopleSoft, and there's also some minor enhancements that we have a number of clients ask us to kind of tailor the page to their specific needs. And we kind of get towards the end of our presentation today to really identify, you know, some of the key points of going the automated reconciliation and forecasting route. Um, one of the big items that we see cited is the support um, to support increasing compliance requirements. We either need to have insight into better insight into our outbound payments or to better monitor fraud. Um, we might have a need to automate financial reconciliations, bank reconciliations, so that we can cut down on some of the manual business process and be more strategic as accounting and treasury teams. We also might want to reduce resource costs, and it's not just compliance. It might be in an AP department, and we might want somebody to be more effective than manually reconciling items all day. We also see a lot of improved liquidity management through our real-time cash position reporting. And another one of the bigger items that we see is the ability for multi-currency reconciliations and cash forecasting moving forward. And so that kind of brings us to the end. And I can hand it over to Sarah for our Q&A time. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much, Logan. And just a reminder to everyone, we will be sending out a recording of the webinar to all attendees. So we'll just use the last few minutes here for a few questions that we received. The first one, Logan, is when we move from image 5 to image 21, will the recons we have set up still work correctly? So if you have existing reconciliation rules from your PUM 5, they can be carried forward and they can still work in your PUM 21 instance. So you might be going through an upgrade or you might not have a need to do a one-to-many reconciliation and you're saying my one-to-one -one rules work just fine, but I have to take a new image. So you do have the ability to carry those forward and it is actually a fairly simplistic process to get those to move forward. So that's a good question. Perfect. And our second one is, 
What are some of the common roadblocks that you or Alir have encountered while implementing PeopleSoft cash forecasting and bank, bank reconciliation? What can we do on our end to properly prepare ourselves? Um, from the first part, one of the core issues that we see from a bank recon perspective are clients not necessarily understanding their current process. And, and you might have too many individual resources that do one step in your reconciliation effort. And so being able to really identify who are the people that are responsible, actionable, and accountable for those items can be difficult at times. And so really getting everybody together so that we can truly identify the current state process and then Alir can make a uh, proposed viable solutions recommendation is really the big path that we like to go down. Um, and our other issue that we cited during the presentation was the bank statement formatting. So there's ways for us to get around the SWIFT versus BAI2 issue with some pretty common customizations to the application, but it does make it a lot more streamlined if every one of your bank partners are passing us a BAI2 or an MT940 and we're not co-mingling the two. Thanks, Sarah. Perfect. And the next one is, what would you say is the biggest value add to implementing PeopleSoft automated cash forecasting in bank reconciliation? I'd say we touched on it a lot today, and it's truly the automation perspective of it. Automating bank recon and cash forecasting really allows our user base to spend their time in more of a strategic way. They they eliminate the manual entry in Excel workbooks all day long, and they can now start to get into more of a strategic initiatives with their treasury teams or their AP teams or their accounting teams. The automation also allows us to properly reconcile transactions and also is much less air prone to air than going the manual-based Excel route. Um, from a forecasting perspective, it can give us near real-time insight so that treasurers and analysts can make more strategic liquidity decisions, investment decisions, and kind of report in a little more of a timely manner. Awesome. Thanks, Sarah. Well, it doesn't look like we have any other questions that are coming in, but if you, oh, just kidding, we just got one more. Hold on one second. Have you helped any clients that used Chesapeake Trex, T-R-E-C-S, bank recon system migrate to PeopleSoft? We can answer that question offline. We can take down, Sarah has the ability to get your email and we can reach out to you directly and communicate what we've seen with previous clients in that situation and how we've migrated between platforms and give you a little more of an in-depth uh, view. It might be more of a sidebar conversation. Sure, absolutely. So we'll make sure that we'll reach out to you with some answers and some follow-up discussions in regard to the Chesapeake system. We did receive another question, Logan. So it says, is bank statement accounting work the same or any enhancements with PUM 18? So ask so bank, bank statement, statement accounting. accounting. Yes, yeah, bank statement accounting is identical post PUM 18. So that's why we really didn't cover it at all today, just because there's no new net change between pre-PUM 18 and PUM 18 moving forward. Perfect. And it looks Thanks, like Sarah. we're right at the hour here. So if we, oh, one last question real quick. Are ACH returns reconciliation supported in image 18? You can set up ACH returns as reconciliations. They're depending on the scenario and depending on the level of returns that you guys are posting. So what could happen is, is if you send an outbound pay cycle with a batch of ACHs and one of them gets rejected by the bank, then that batch isn't going to auto-reconcile the first time. So we can handle those ACH returns in a number of ways. What we do is usually propose a couple different solutions and let you guys know which ones that you would prefer to go. Um, it would also depend on the, on the volume of your ACH returns. If it's few and far between, it might be easier to reconcile them as an external transaction. If they're more frequent, then we can help uh, remove them from the total mass of the grouping of the one to many and still allow all the good transactions to reconcile to kind of minimize the number of exceptions that a user base would have to deal with. Perfect. And 
We're going to cut it right there just because we are at the hour, and we will be sending a recorded version of this webinar to everyone who is listed as an attendee here. So please be on the lookout for that via email um, within the next day or so. And we'll also be following up with any of the questions that we weren't able to get to today, and also with the information of an ALIR contact that you can get a hold of if you have any follow-up questions or anything that pops up later on today. We're happy to help in any way we can or go through anything again with you. So. Anything that you need, just let us know. But with that, we'll thank Logan for his hard work and his great presentation today, and we'll go ahead and end the call. Have a great Appreciate day, everybody.